arrives. <laughs> All right, so we are live. So, hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Sword and Laser. Uh, this is a bonus episode of the Sword and Laser this evening, and we are joined by a great many wonderful people. Um, hi, I'm Veronica Belmont. Um, so, I, I don't even know where to start with everyone tonight. We're, we're joined by the authors and contributors to the Mongoliad, and um, I guess just we'll go down the line. We'll start with uh, maybe Cooper, and you just give your little brief uh, background about your, your work and your participation in the Mongoliad. Briefly, so I was sword fighter first before writer. Had always written just as vocation, advocation, not vocation. Started sword fighting with Neil in 2004, and then through a long series of happenstance and events, uh, got invited to join this writing group and uh, jumped at the chance. <laughs> and who are you joined by this evening? I'm Ed. Hi there. Hello. I am, I'm a writer first, and and not a swords person at all. Actually, I have the distinction of being the only non-combatant, I think, in the group. Possibly, <laughs> maybe, I'm not sure if Greg does stuff. Um, does. And I also live 3,000 miles away from everyone else. So my involvement has largely been through Skype and um, trying to remind everyone that not everything is testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> that is a large portion of my working life as well. So I can definitely get in there with you there. Um, Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm the son of Greg Bear, who couldn't be here today, since I'm assuming he doesn't have a webcam, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do some other writing myself. I did the script for a Jurassic Park comic book that got published through at EW, and I uh, also worked on this video game, Ion. And you know, after that, me and Cooper, we wrote most of the Mongolian sections of the Mongoliad, the stuff that involves Ogadai Ka and all those, those wacky horsemen. Oh, man, I'm a huge Jurassic Park fan, so... Now I'm going to be all fangirly on you there. Uh, tell me a little bit about the, the Jurassic Park comic book. How, how many uh, versions was it? How many uh, parts of the series? Oh, there's a five-issue miniseries called Dangerous Games. The premise is that it's sort of uh, it's, uh, the most dangerous game set on the Jurassic Park island. This, this uh, Nicaraguan drug lord buys up the island and hunts the CIA agent alive on it. And he escapes, of course, with the help of this crazy lady who's been living on the island, who's sort of like Jane Goodall but for velociraptors. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, Joseph, thank you for joining us. Tell us about yourself. Um, I was a uh, sort of a, um, I, I was a, I was a writer for, well, writer and martial artist about the same time. Um, I actually started out training with um, one of uh, the associates of this group, Michael Tinker Pierce. And after a while, he brought me, he kind of brought me into this group, and I, I trained with them for a while. Um, and uh, then, and then I was, I sort of kind of, I. Neil asked me for a writing sample one day, and uh, and I kind of stumbled in. I stumbled into the rest of the Mongoliad. Um, I uh, I have I primarily wrote on the uh, circus branch, circus the circus of swords branch of the Mongoliad, and um, I uh, also am the uh, assistant instructor for a um, medieval martial arts class on joint joint base Lewis McCord. Well, what happened was I was the uh, administrator of the email list for our, our group, and yes. when Joe joined it, uh, I noticed his email address um, implied that he was a writer. Uh, I, won't, I won't say what it was, but um, uh, it, was, uh, it, it, it made me think he must be writing something, so I started internet stalking him and found some of his stuff that, <laughs> uh, that he posted on the internet and uh, figured out that um, he, was, uh, he was cut out for this job. So. Well, thank you. And though you haven't been introduced yet, that of course is Neil Stevenson, who is joining us from his treadmill this evening, which I think is an excellent way to do an interview. I think that's very ingenious. And are you drinking a Guinness while you're on your treadmill? What was that? Yeah. So we've been out last. Uh, these things even out. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we both. Uh, it is after six where I am. So. Um, Anyway, yeah, I'm Neil Stevenson. I'm an author. I've been an author for a while. I've uh, been interested in sword fighting for a long time. I've been pursuing it as a, a kind of martial arts project for about 10 years now. got interested in it when I was writing a historical novel with people who were sword fighting. And I wanted to uh, try to get the, the sword fighting details right. Um, and uh, so uh, after a while, got sufficiently interested in the topic that I began to ask myself why uh, why sword fighting is depicted in uh, in film and entertainment uh, 
was always shown as a kind of sledgehammer battle between morons. Um, and, uh, and that's how we got into, into the idea of trying to write some new entertainment material that, that might uh, provide a more realistic and more nuanced view of, um, of how these people actually did it back in the day. Great. And uh, one last introduction, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Mark Teppo, who is, has a, an extensive library behind him. Thank you for joining us, Mark. I've been, I've been moving books around all day so that it looked good back there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, can, I did not do the same for my, my meager uh, bookshelf over here in the corner. Um, so tell us about your background. Um, I am a, a less, less accomplished writer than Mr. Stevenson. I only have a couple books by name. Um, and then I stumbled into this as sort of the, the guy who could keep track of all the details. Um, and then it became the guy who could herd the cats. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> He's just not a, less nerd famous, but uh, I, I disagree with, uh, with his self-deprecating approach uh, to that. So maybe for the people who haven't um, experienced it yet, can you give us a little bit of a background of the Mongoliad and, and what it means and, and what the storyline of the book is? Whoever Mark, wants to jump in. Mark Depo. No, I've answered this question too much recently. It's someone else's turn. <laughs> Joe, do it. Oh, boy. Um, well, basically, it's, uh, in brief, um, the pre core premise is that it takes place in Europe during uh, 1241, during the Mongol invasions, and uh, the, the kind of central construct it's built around is what happened in 1241 is when the Mongols invaded Europe, they were on the verge of taking over the place. They had just stomped every army that had opposed them. They had taken over most of Russia, and... Uh, then what happened was Ogadai Khan, the Khan of Khans, died in a hunting accident, and all of the Khans went home. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Let me see the air quotes. Yeah, hunting, hunting accident. accident. <laughs> and so, uh, and so our, our premise is that a group of a group of knights of an ancient order discover that um, discover this fact that if the Khan of Khans dies, all of the Khans have to go home in order to have a chance of becoming the next great Khan, and so uh, they decide to go and make that happen. <clears throat> And Excellent. adventure ensues. By the way, I'm Tom Merritt. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of our audience. I've got a, a lot of our questions from Goodreads, and there's a chat room going on as well. And I think that's a perfect segue into Joseph's question, who wants to know, who came up with the idea? And he's referring not just to the Mongolia, but to the idea of creating the website and, and doing the collaborative storytelling there. And he says, and have you killed them yet? <laughs> <laughs> um... <clears throat> It, it's, it sort of came out of uh, a, a discussion we had about a screenplay, actually, when um, somebody we knew down in Hollywood pointed out that if we were going to try to sell something to Hollywood, Hollywood would sort of do a land grab and, and try to, to wrap up everything they possibly could, and it would behoove us to sort of stake, put a stake in the ground um, and demonstrate some, some, some activity in other areas than just the film. And then there was a long pause in the room, and, and somebody said, well, what could we do to build an audience, this, this room full of people? Um, what can we write, possibly do for cheap or free? We can write. Hmm. Yeah, we could, we could write something, I suppose. Um, and it was, it, was, it was sort of as, as <clears throat> unexciting as that. It was, I, we could write something, I suppose. Um, and then um, we could write something awesome. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> that's true. I, we are we are laying down the history. So, uh, <clears throat> so yes, so awesome. said, we can write something awesome. We can write something fantastic. And even three thousand miles away, Ed woke up in the middle of the night going, "Oh my God, something awesome's happening!" I have to. Go <laughs> I smell pros. Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly how it happened. Actually, it was just like that. Um, did, you get, did you have any kind of management solution for for working together at the same time? Was it difficult to coordinate? Solution would be a strong word. <laughs> Um, everybody, everybody looked at me a lot, um, and I, I, I went, yeah, I, I know where that is. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a, I, I'm good at small details, and I seem to not let go of them very easily. And, and unfortunately, I, I didn't get out of the room when people started looking at me. So. And Mark has been totally fantastic at what he does. He is the, no matter how much we sing his praises, he will still be the relatively unsung hero. Amen. Sure, yeah. 
Excellent. So we have um, we have lots of questions actually. I think one of the biggest questions was the the collaboration question. Um, Charles writes. Uh, so so we already talked about team leader actually. Um, where does personal preference and style come in? How did you? I guess I'm not really sure what he means there. Maybe he means I reconcile it would be yeah like amongst all the different voices. Mm -hmm. That's a good. That's a very good point. Yeah. Is there is a was there any kind of control over who had the final say in, in the style and the 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 way the writing came out in the end? Well, it was kind of Mark's job to apply the final polish to everything as the head story editor. Yeah. yeah. Um, and We're also, also in different branches. So each branch had sort of a different voice. So yeah. There was the Mongol branch, the Brethren branch, the Circus branch, the Rome branch, and so part of the logic thought at first was, since you're writing on a certain branch that has a different voice, it, it should work. That was the simple thought. Simple mm -hmm. thoughts are so misleading. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, then people started, and then people started moving around on the branches, and that totally, totally messed up that plan. What do you mean this branch has no robots? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yes, there was a judicious amount of excising of robots. We're <laughs> <laughs> sure this is a musical. Oh, good idea. I would love to see all the revisions and changes that you guys probably made as you went along. And no, the, the the best stuff that was written in the project uh, was Ed's um, marginal notes on other people's work. Which, uh, <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, one, day, one day that would <laughs> see the light of day. Um, you know that there's a, uh, a problem with the chapter when the most entertaining thing about reading the chapter is reading Edie's um, notes uh, off to one side in red letters. I actually have a, I, she actually gave me one of my favorite notes I've ever received on, any, on anything because it was a, it was a, I just remembered it was a single line after a paragraph and I believe the line was, um, I would love to be able to comment on this paragraph, but I have absolutely no idea what the hell Joe is talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Any chance we'll ever get to see some of those notes in the form of like a cutting room floor kind of short book, perhaps? Sure, we don't have enough going on already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and how did you, I mean, I know the Mongolian website itself was a, a big source of collaboration with the audience, and that's one of the questions we have from Douglas. He wants to know how much of the non-core writing group input during the development process ended up in the book. But also, how, if you could answer that and how you collaborated, how you were able to share these notes back and forth with each other. It was really ad hoc. I mean, it was yeah. people emailing. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you we had some awesome workflow system figured out, but it was uh, people um, emailing. Uh, mostly word files back and forth uh, in a rather chaotic pattern with, um, with track changes uh, turned on and um, emails and kind of anything that, uh, anything that would get the job done. Well, and we'd also have these uh, 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 oh, go ahead. Sunday meetings. We'd have our uh, Sunday martial arts meetup and then writers meeting after with coffee and pastries. And then we'd you know, get super high on caffeine and flesh out the details of what we're going to write in the next couple weeks. So were those were those in person or were they over Skype video? I mean, I guess if you're eating eating snacks and having coffee together, everyone except Ed was was there. <laughs> yeah, Ed and her crickets. Right. Yes, many connection issues. Many oh. connection issues. We would show her the pastries. Yes, they would. Yes, I'd be teased. Yeah, that was <laughs> but a lot I wouldn't of fun, actually, actually get to. A <laughs> we owe her one massive box of donuts when she finds. Amen. Them. Excellent. Oh, nice. And she would have. She would of course, you know get back at us by taking her laptop outside where it was sunny. Oh, that's true, yes. And, and we would all go, oh, sun. That's <laughs> what's that? So which, which, which coast are most of you on? So uh, we're mostly west coast. Mostly west coast, okay. Yeah, and hence the remark about the sun. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, you I guys don't get a lot of that, do you? Except I, I should say that now. once the... Um, well, okay, well, today we have some. Today we have some. Uh, I should say that once we got the chapters written, um, we did have a, a nice um, solution for actually putting them up on the internet, which is called the Personal Ubiquitous Literature Platform, which is the system that our colleague Jeremy, mostly Jeremy uh, Bornstein, put together to kind of handle the, the process of getting things out and, and 
sort of propagating them out to people's mobile devices or iPads or whatever it was that they were uh, that they were um, reading the, the material on. Um, we also had a question from Jonathan who said, as someone who subscribed to the Mongoliad and web forum on its launch day in September 2010, but who hasn't kept up with news about future plans, I'm wondering if you intend to continue using the serial format for upcoming installments in the Four World universe. I, for one, quite enjoyed having a new chapter made available to read at fairly regular intervals over a long period of time. It's nice that he says fairly regular intervals. Thank you, you, John, just Jonathan, for signing up in the first place. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Yeah. The the interesting thing about the serial format was that we we learned a lot about how to do a serial, Um, and one of the things that I think got us in trouble a little bit was the fact that we had four storylines, and so there was this sudden realization that it was a month between installments of a given storyline, which I think didn't exactly work to our benefit. Created a false sense of, I can put this off for yes. three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> that never happened around here. No, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that, they think that you know, we're, we're in the stages of sort of, of sort of, we're in the stages of sort of, of, of Closing the books, if you will, on on the Mongolia and, and and sort of getting down with the finalized um, edition of it that we're we're happy with, and then sort of making some plans and and changing our minds um, <clears throat> about what's going to happen next. And I, so I think our 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 next attempt at a serial is going to be a little more focused. I don't say focused, but a little more more with an eye towards. You know, delivering something that's going to have that sort of oh my gosh, it's Wednesday, I got to get that next chapter, and it's in, and I remember exactly where I left off, sort of thing. Instead of this 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 sprawling epic that that it was very easy to sort of get behind on. Mm-hmm. So. Did you each have assignments? Is that how it worked? You had like due dates for certain parts you were supposed to get in, or yeah. was it more much more collaborative than that? Supposed to is a key word there. <laughs> supposed to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it started off as being very structured. I had we had you know a pair on each branch, which we had seven, and there were four branches, so you know the math doesn't work. <laughs> um, but as as schedules changed, people started to move around, and and um, yeah, the the scheduling. <laughs> Neil laughed and said, you know, you had three weeks to put things off. Um, yeah, there was a little bit of of. of of scheduling that went on that was that was sort of, of a scramble here and there of it's the week before Thanksgiving who's in town uh, <laughs> yeah I was yeah, that, that was, was killer was the, the Thanksgiving Christmas uh, oh yeah oh boy that, yeah, that was well and I lost power I lost power in January and I found the Starbucks within like 10 miles of my house that was of course everybody in the surrounding neighborhood was at because they were charging their phones and whatnot. <laughs> I squatted in the corner next to an outlet for five or six hours because I had to finish the final edit on the final chapter. Oh wow. Wow working. that was really crunch time huh? I was not going to leave Starbucks until it was done and people were glaring and wondering why I was there and I had somebody come in and, and spell me so I could go to the bathroom and come back to my spot. It's like I am not moving. Um, you should have been one of those guys that brings his own external monitor to the Starbucks with the laptop. That's always impressive. Yeah, that happens here in San Francisco every so often, and it's always very amusing to watch. Yeah. I thought you were going to say one of those guys who brings his own urinal. <laughs> that happens more in the East Bay than in San Francisco. Yes. Uh, it comes in Soto, South Seattle, where we live. How how mu- how did the community involvement pan out from the conception of the website to how how much interaction you guys got and then what did you end up doing with that involvement? We we well, someone else can. No, you're Mr. <laughs> community. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we stayed up on we stayed on top of. I mean, I stayed up on top of whatever on all the conversations, and and you know we may not have have admitted that we were reading everything, but but we were. We were reading a lot of our stuff that was going on, a lot of the, a lot of the, the back and forth of the of the the fans, um, and as our our buffer dwindled um, for a while there, we were several months ahead, and so that when we put a chapter up and people were talking about it, we were like, yeah, we've we've already we've already moved on, but. Um, 
during the Christmas, the Thanksgiving Christmas black hole when, when we lost our buffer and things became very much more um, down to the wire, there came some opportunities for, the, for what the fans were talking about to influence what was going to happen next. Um, there's a sequence with Andreas, one of the, one of the more <coughs> outspoken knights, um, with some horses that um, we put up and the fan community immediately said, oh my gosh, this, a knight like this of noble character and all this stuff would not steal horses. Hmm. And we had this moment where we're like, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, um, and so we had, to, and that became that became a conversation point. The next meeting, we had to figure out how we were going to solve that problem without having to go back and just edit out the scene because the scene played really well. Um, and it was well, a great sort of you know last line as you're leaving the room sorts of scenes, and we didn't want to have to take it all out. But and so we had to sort of figure out how that was going to res- be resolved. And I think that was part of this. Is that sort of the beginning of when we decided? what was going to happen with Andreas and who he was going to be? Yes. Was that it? Was that sort of the moment where we went, oh, he's that guy? Yeah, and uh, and Mark's actually being a little a little charitable here because that the, that sequence also involved him telling me, no, Joe, you can't kill all these people. <laughs> That's great. Put um, the sword down. Yeah. There's another question that Jonathan had. Um, he said... Secondly, when the project launched, there was talk of how the community would, could get involved with the story. Um, he said he was initially very active on the forums and wiki, but over time drifted into a more passive role. Um, so how did that aspect of the Mongolia compare to your original plans, which seemed to include people writing their own stories set in the same universe? And how did that change over time? Well, people did. I mean, we have fan fiction on mm-hmm. side. Was that initially supposed to be incorporated into the main story, or is that something that was just supposed to take place outside of the main storyline of it's the book? Hard to, it's hard to put it into the main story um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, and you know, some of them are just sort of legal financial reasons. I mean, we're charging people for this stuff. So if, if fans start putting things into sort of paid content, then that you know, life suddenly gets complicated. So, and, and also, it's just um, hard to uh, um, I mean, it was hard enough getting seven uh, novelists to collaborate on, uh, on, on a shared book project, but to, to sort of turn it into a crowdsourced, uh, you know, epic novel, uh, I think would have been asking uh, a little, a little too much of um, of the already hardworking Mr. Tepo. But do you think that's something that's possible? Do you think yeah. that a widely collaborative, multi-author, you know, hundreds of authors potentially project, uh, put, you know, not necessarily for profit, but a free web project could could work in that regard? Sure. I mean, um, Eric Flint and, and Jim Minns over at Bain have been doing it for, for some years now with the 1632 project, I think it is. Maybe they're, maybe they're up to 1634. Um, but they have a, they have, they, I mean, they've, they've gone through a a lot of this sort of growth of of figuring this out, and um, they have a very regimented and rigid sort of structure of of how content gets added to canon from from the fans. And it's, um, I would talk to Jim Minns at more than one convention in the last couple of years and kept giving me the eyeball saying, you know, we've we've been through this. I can help you. I can can warn you some of the pitfalls. And um, and then, you know, people pass between us and I wouldn't see them again for six hours and that sort of thing. And so, um, so I definitely think it's possible. And I, I think it's, we, we didn't, we didn't lay ground rules solidly enough. And part of the reason we didn't is we didn't want to put people in boxes. So we wanted to see what they could come up with. Um, but the problem was is that, that, Turns out that that's not as freeing as you would think. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes uh, a little structure is necessary, perhaps. Yeah, and um, as, you know, as Neil said, it just sort of got away from us. And, and yeah. how amazed were you by the fans' interaction with a project like this? Because, for example, this is not at all on the same scale of what you've done at all. But we just launched our, our wiki for Sword and Laser, and within the first week, we have entries that I never e- would have even thought of, and and all the users have put in a ton of work already. Is it, were you just totally blown away by how much people wanted to participate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that we, there was a number of, um, there were a number of individuals who were, who were sort of annoyed that we had, we had started the wiki. 
they were, they were pleasantly annoyed. They, but it was one of those things where we had tried to seed it a little bit so that there was stuff there. And and um, I got a nice, a nice email from one user who was just was like, dude, why are you getting in our way? And I'm like, I'm not getting in your way. I'd, I'd love to have you do it, but I just wanted to give you something to start with. And, and clearly now I'll stop. But um, but yeah, they really, they really, they really jumped on it and, and had a good time with it. And, and you know, we're doing all sorts of things. You're telling Mark to shut up and stop adding new stuff to the wiki because they were, you know, I got this. Yeah. <laughs> there's, 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 yeah. Um, and there's a really lovely timeline that they put up yes. um, that, that became the thing I went and checked on more than occasion to remember where, where things were happening. Um, or we would pass around illustrations. Somebody would post an illustration and it would end up in the email, wow, go look at this guy. This is phenomenal. Or it would come up in the writer's meeting. We'd fight for a couple hours and sweat and then come up and share what had been on the wiki or what illustration was new, what was there. Oh, totally. We got a question from Douglas uh, about Western martial arts. He says, for people who have a continuing interest in Western martial arts, what resources do you recommend? Um, it's okay. pretty broad. Can you guys hear me? Because my picture is breaking up. Yeah, we can I'm still hear you. What century would you like? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good, good follow-up question. Yeah, I'll, keep, um, I'll keep talking unless somebody calls me on my cell phone and tells me no one understands what I'm saying. No, Neil, we can hear you. Can you hear us? I okay, well, can. I mean, WMA encompasses a, a pretty wide range of things, starting with sort of ancient Greek hoplite reenactment and Roman legion stuff up to medieval you know, Viking things, medieval Renaissance, uh, and up into the 19th century Victorian. Uh, martial arts, so it's a pretty huge, um, it's a pretty huge tapestry, uh, and so a, a lot just depends on which part of that you personally want to zero in on and uh, and get interested in. Um, there's, Is there a good introductory of sort of resource for somebody who would, uh, doesn't even know which part they're interested in? They're just sort of interested in swords. Um. It's, uh, there's a there's a there's a couple. Um, one website I can recommend uh, to anyone who's interested is the Hema Alliance. It's literally just HemaAlliance.com uh, or maybe .org. I'm not sure which one exactly. Um, and that's a massive. It's basically a massive organization of various groups sharing information and uh, kind of it's kind of an umbrella organization. And there's there's several others. It's not the only one. Seems to be dot com. It's H E M A, yes. right? Yeah. Yep, H E M A. That's the. If you go to swordschool.com, there's a lot of good stuff there on uh, on uh, long sword, which is what we focus on quite a bit, and and on rapier as well, which is a later form. Mm -hmm. So, as as authors out, um, would you consider another project like this in the future? Is this something that you really enjoy doing, or is it easier to just kind of? Well, I'm imagining it's easier, but is the the worth of working on such a large collaborative project worth the the effort? I guess in a way. Yeah, I'm listening to all of your answers. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. 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 Emphatically, yes. Yes. <laughs> What were some of the biggest challenges uh, in doing this project, other than the the pure collaborative efforts? The crickets for me. <laughs> That's an in joke. Explain, right? the crickets. Yeah, Explain the crickets. The, for some reason, the Skype connection always seemed to. Um, after about 15 or 20 minutes, we would just hear these chirping sounds that would get louder and louder and louder and louder until they were louder than anyone. Are you? Do you happen to use a Plantronics headset? Uh -huh. No, this was just me and the iBook. Interesting, because there is a, a well-known issue with the plan, a certain brand of Plantronics headsets that after about 25, 30 minutes, it starts doing a chirping sound. It's oh, the C-Media driver mm -hmm. in particular, and we call it Cyloning, but it sounds like the same thing. Yeah, it, it sounds exactly the same, but it's not. But anyway, that's not a very interesting answer. I'm sure the guys have far more interesting <laughs> things to complain about. Um, dealing with Nikki's crickets on the other end was, was always entertaining. Because <laughs> um, we... we all the way across the stack. Oh man, we how many different we tried what? We tried I don't know how many different computers, different configurations. We we didn't we didn't want to have to tell her it was her, but <laughs> Oh it's not us, it's you. Yes, exactly. Well we would just turn the visual off and then I could do a pedicure or something while we were talking. That's what we were doing too. 
with a mani pedi. Sure. Sometimes I'll, <laughs> the, the, the truth comes out. <laughs> uh, sometimes nope. I would read something that uh, one of the more accomplished writers had written the week before, and go back and look at what I'd read and think, I don't even want to turn this in. I, I got to rewrite this sucker. So I'd be up against the deadline, and Mark would finally say, "It's fine. It's fine." And then of course he would help us rewrite it. But that, that was daunting at some times. And I'd get this feeling that Neil or Greg or Mark would crank it out in a week, and I, it would take me, you know, three weeks to get mine done. So that well, was a challenge. That that's what they say about books and poetry. They're, they're never truly finished. They're just abandoned. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we would occasionally go back and edit things in the serial format. You can have a few ninja edits, if you will. Mm -hmm. Tell them about the ninja edits, Mark. You know, I was trying to remember. I was trying to remember those the other day. Um, I was asked about those the other day, and I can't. I can't remember any of them that we did that were really, really. I, I can remember one hard one, uh, and then it turned out to be physically impossible for someone to actually leap that distance. Oh right, right. The ro yes. <laughs> what about boy meets gruel? That was brilliant. <laughs> I don't okay. Point on that one. Yes. That was, I yeah, tell us that story. Out. Yes, I um. That was a Neil title. That was a Neil chapter title. He wrote it quietly on the board one day, and um, and then wandered off. and And I pretended not to see it. <clears throat> um, and then several months later, he reminded me that he had written that on the board, and then I admitted that I had pretended not to see it. So, um, so that was that's true. That title, that chapter title, changed. Did you guys do a lot of editing of each other's work? Is that how? Is that kind of how it worked, or was there one master editor? Well, that would be Mark is the master editor, but we all, you know, contributed ideas and polished up each other's work. We had it passed off from author to author. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, every. I mean, I, I've 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 got the record somewhere of um, what how much everybody touched everything, and and um, there was a lot of back and forth in in, in various different. Yeah various different um, um, formats, timelines. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was distracted by it. <laughs> Tom <laughs> popping in and out. <laughs> Screen yeah. clicking on me. Um, yeah, so I mean, it would be, you know, we, we tried to have this, this layering of, depending on availability of, of and this, this helped contribute to the overall sort of sameness of voice, that, that nobody would really write anything in a vacuum. There would be several people who would touch it. Um, for varying different reasons, um, you know that 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 Ed wasn't necessarily up on all the the intricacies of of Mongolian culture, and so you know her her pass would be more towards language and, and general sort of does the sentence make sense, um, and then we'd have somebody else who would be just looking at at um, particulars of 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 um, culture and whatnot. So there's there's the varying layers of, of of what the responsibilities of any individual were on um, um, how the how the chapter. We would also discuss sometimes characters like Eric and I would go back and forth on what Gonsuk would or wouldn't do or Leon wouldn't wouldn't say. So before a chapter might go to Mark, you know, Eric might send this and say, I don't think Leon would do that. She wouldn't be that passive. Or I would say, you know, I think Gonsuk is actually in love with her and he's got to do this. And so sometimes we would change the voice or or even change an entire scene because you're right, that character would do this or that. Um, I think the people that touch things the most would be would be Mark and Ed because it was there was a they were both doing Uber editing on pieces. Um, That's true. Although I think Mark gets more certainly as we went along, I did less of that and Mark did more. I mean, really, um, as I'm thinking back over the whole experiment, I just I, I don't mean to be fawning, but it really is sort of remarkable that Mark survived. Yeah. <laughs> Survives a strong term. You know, it's the kids are different like the batshit insane religious visions. Um. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I think we may we may have. Go ahead, Tom. Similar to how television writers write series. Yeah, in many ways, it's it was yeah. a similar. And Mark is the showrunner. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. So before we go, uh, what's up for Mongolia Book Two? Not not to make you all pass out. We just got <laughs> this one out the door. Um, I we, I just pulled the rug out from all of them last week, so <laughs> the the, pl the the plans have changed. Um, what? Oh, wait, you, were, you weren't there. Sorry. Oh, By the way, oh. Uh, fascinating. Plans have changed. You should you should talk to Ed. She knows. 
Uh, I do. Oh, I know something. Okay, but not not for not for book two. Secrets. Not for the second. Are you talking about the second book in the? I'm sorry. Should I just keep my mouth shut? <laughs> we <laughs> are broadcasting live, just so you guys know. Book two or season two? Part two out of three of the stuff we've already written for the website, re-edited for book form. Um, so the part of the part of this also this 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 hilarious sort of back and forth about 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 terms stems from the fact that. Um, when we first started doing it, we were going to write The Mongolia, and that was going to be the, the story we were going to write. And then it became very clear that we weren't going to be able to, well, it became very clear that there were more ideas than there was space, sort of, but that, that we didn't have to finish it. I'm going to just make this sound like this is, and this becomes the medieval version of Lost, um, which is, is, is that we had, we had enough material and we had enough ideas that there were, there were going to be opportunities for us to do other things. And so, at that point, calling the project the Mongoliad wasn't entirely accurate. The Mongoliad became the first project. And then we started talking about Four World, which is the larger span of history that we're, that we're covering, which is, you know, all of it. Um, and in there, because the original structure of the serial had been sort of modeled on a TV show, we'd called the Mongoliad Season 1 of, of Four World. And then we decided that, well, clearly there should be season two. Um, but what we're referring to as season two... <laughs> I'm confused, too, now. I've it's, 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 well, anyway, the short answer is, the short answer is, is that, yes, there, there's, there, is, there is more plan, there's more material. Um, Do we have a deadline? Back 500 years. We have a deadline? Oh, yeah. You weren't here. You don't know what it is. Sorry, Kyle. When you get back into town, we'll, we'll talk about it. Great. Okay. As long as it's not before I get back into town. <laughs> when, well, when, do you get, when do you get back? But what? I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not answering that question. <laughs> I uh, but so, in that. so in the short, in the short term, um, you know, book one is out. Um, book two will be out in September. Um, book three will be out in February. Um, and we've already written those. Yes. That was right. That's yeah. what I was trying to say. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. That's great. And then season two is what you're all getting okay. ready to find out put more together. About it. Yes. Um, yes. So it, it's more, I think, better to call it the next stage because it's not all. It's not all going to be medieval period. I guess. Right. And I've read some about the the sort of flash forward. Yeah. The, the, there's a larger project. There's a, a, a secondary project called the side quests, which are going to be sort of forward and backwards in time. Um, but there is also going to be some larger, larger, um, some longer pieces that are going to be directly related to the Mongoliad in the medieval period as well. And so we're sorting out the, the details of that. Um, they thought we were done, but not done. Never done. Never actually never done. done. <laughs> never stop. All right, well, I think we've kept you all quite long enough. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, we, of course, were joined by Eric Baer, Joseph Brassi, E.D. de Birmingham, Cooper Moo, Neil Stevenson, who I think uh, maybe took off on his treadmill. Exactly. Just, he just kept going. <laughs> and Mark Teppo, who is apparently one of the hardest working men yeah, I think I've spoken to lately. So well done, everyone on the project. Uh, we're, we're very excited to check it out, and I know that a lot of our listeners and viewers out there are very excited as well if they haven't contributed. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.